A warm welcome. You're joining us here at Hyde Park. The issue of vaccinations for uh, uh, the most important members of our society, our children, has been a subject that has seen some big questions being raised. Now, with most adults uh, having been covered in the vaccination program, parents are now posing the all-important question of when their children will be included in the drive. However, there are safety concerns as well. Parents are also questioning whether current vaccines can pose a bigger threat to the health and safety of their kids than the actual COVID-19 virus. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization says that more evidence is needed on the use of the different COVID-19 vaccines in children to be able to make general recommendations on vaccinations. The WHO's strategic advisory group of experts has concluded that the Pfizer vaccine is suitable for use by anyone aged 12 years and above, while children aged between 12 and 15 who are at high risk may be given this vaccine alongside their priority, other priority groups. With that, we will be talking at length on this issue and another important issue faced by kids today, mainly the psycho psychological aspects of lockdowns and prolonged home-based restrictions. I've invited to our studios tonight at Hyde Park, Dr. Surantha Pereira, consultant pediatrician and neonatologist, um, past president of the Perinatal Society of Sri Lanka, member of the College of Pedi uh, Pediatricians and Sri Lanka Medical Association. I've also invited uh, to our studios Dr. Miro Chandadasa, consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist. A warm welcome to uh, medical professionals joining us tonight. Um, with the WHO saying that more research is needed, Dr. Suranta Pereira, I'd like to start off uh, asking you what your personal view is in terms of vaccination uh, of children. Parents are worried about their children, but we say more studies are required. What is your opinion going forward? Yes, uh, vaccination of the children is a hot topic. And uh, initially, WHO wants to vaccinate adults, uh, especially the elderly people, above 65 years, and then uh, vaccinate uh, uh, young and um, in the people in the middle age group mm -hmm. who have uh, comorbidities. What I meant was some of these uh, patient, uh, people may have c uh, cancer and uh, hypertension, diabetes, etc. And not only that, some of the diseases which lower the immunity. So that we c call the roadmap of vaccination. As you previously mentioned, uh, strategic advisory group of uh, World Health Organization laid down the uh, guidance because uh, they felt like fair, uh, it's very important to have a fair play to equally distribute vaccine to the, all the countries and inside the country uh, look at the uh, needs and uh, the death and uh, survival of the people uh, due to COVID-19 and uh, develop a plan. Sometimes this can be a little bit uh, varies from the laid down guidelines. Mm -hmm. So uh, at this point, we have vaccinated uh, elderly and we have vaccinated the, uh, especially the uh, people between 18 to 65 years uh, with comorbidities. Now this is the time to discuss about vaccination of the children. And here the priority should be given to children with comorbidities between 12 to 19 years. So the, what I meant comorbidities is children who have specific uh, illnesses. These illnesses could have been acquired during the birth or could ha have acquired later. These can be related to problems in the cardiovascular system, respiratory system, gastrointestinal system. Not only that, here we focus on children with, uh, who, ha who are cancer survivors as well as p children who have thalassemia children who have diabetes and some certain group of children can have uh, low immunity, uh, congenitally acquired or late acquired or sometimes they may be uh, on certain medication long term which lower the immunity. These children are really vulnerable if they get COVID-19. If we look at the limited number of deaths which has happened in this country related to a children population, most of them are belong to this category, although the numbers are smaller, belong to this category. So I think it, it is a priority to uh, vaccinate uh, these children. 
and other side of the coin, uh, we have two population in this country, elderly as well as the children. Both are vulnerable. Children are vulnerable because they have a, uh, they, they, although they have a good immunity, good amount of uh, T lymphocytes uh, and uh, antibodies which can uh, um, uh, counteract uh, when they get the viruses, uh, but uh, they are vulnerable in different ways. So with the adult population, uh, because uh, they are, they, their immunity is lower, and when they get uh, any diseases, uh, they can succumb to uh, the etio cause uh, and then as well as complications. So at this point, we have to balance the equation. Uh, one point is uh, we have to look at vaccination of the children, uh, and then we have already started it. And the other side of the coin is vaccinating the uh, elderly, especially third dose, because uh, the, some of the studies have revealed 7% of the population in this elderly group, uh, they, do, they did not develop the expected uh, mm -hmm. immunity or the antibody, uh, antibody level. W when you say that these are the two, um, the two priorities that we must focus on, at Doctor, this at, this at this point, of the time. Um, a, you're, you're suggesting and recommending uh, that we uh, look at a booster shot for adults as discussed widely. Um, among yes. uh, the health authorities and uh, the government, and also children. Uh, I just want to be clear whether uh, your opinion is that we can look at vaccination of uh, children other than uh, children at risk and uh, who are immunocompromised later, or do you think that also should be a priority? Uh, it, it should take place, but the timeline is the what we uh, mm -hmm. debate. debate. So if we can uh, vaccinate the vulnerable children, and then same time vaccinate, because we are going to get a lot of uh, Pfizer vaccine doses. Mm -hmm. If we can uh, consider giving the third dose, uh, because we need the concurrence of the uh, Ministry of Health. Ministry of Health is advised by special committees. And then uh, once we fulfill those things, then we can uh, think about vaccinating uh, children who are above 16 and 19. That's a one specific group and other group is between 12 and 15. Mm -hmm. So the 16 and 19, the question is whether we can give uh, two doses, and between 12 and 15, the question is whether we should give single dose and see how the immune responds and then plan the second dose. All right. I'd like to turn to Dr. Miru Chandradas. Now, uh, we must not forget the psychological impact of uh, vaccinations to the aspects of this, because this is a foreign subject to us. Uh, COVID-19 is new, yes, but at the same time, um, these vaccines we, we know very little about them. Uh, WHO itself says there is more research that is needed. At the same time, there are anxieties built upon these vaccines, whether we need them or not. And here we are also trying to uh, understand uh, the parents' opinion of requiring vaccines for their children because of the fear of this pandemic. Um, what have you got to tell us uh, when you observe and understand the psychological uh, aspect of these anxieties? So for example, when we say we need to vaccinate the children, uh, there's obviously anxiety among the parents because this is a new thing. So when there's anxiety, we know an entity called mass hysteria. So one person shares some negative information about a vaccine and that is shared in the social media and within minutes, thousand parents are sharing it. So when you are in a COVID mental health crisis, we tend to have what we call the negative attentional bias. That is, if we listen to the news, because we are in, under this pandemic, we mainly focus on the number of deaths, number of positives, but we are forgetting all the positives. For example, like children learning to use online education, children learning to use new methods of learning, all those positives are forgotten and the negatives are given more consideration because of the negative attentional bias. So about vaccinations, Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians, as Dr. Suranta mentioned, have clearly encouraged that and they are just taking decisions to go ahead with that and they will give the timeline soon. For the parents, I have to tell it that is when medical professionals are coming to a decision, we are considering all the evidence around the world. So obviously we have to understand as humans, it's okay to have some anxiety, but for children to go back to school and work with the teachers, these processes need to happen. 
Mm -hmm. And at the same time, when you say we have to understand, um, the, 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 we have to look at the positives, give more prominence to that. But if we just focus on um, the, the, the aspects that bother uh, our parents and our children, again, I go back to uh, the, the, um, the, the nature of this pandemic situation itself. It's new, um, not known to us, and uh, the vaccines as, as new to us, it's still being tested um, around the world. They're trying to understand it. But what is your personal op opinion about the recommendations that are coming up? And at the same time, how parents should approach this? Um, the question of whether their children should be vaccinated. How, how, how would you recommend our parents go about it? So as a psychiatrist, what I have to say is children's brains are more neuroplastic. When we say neuroplastic, their brains have more ability to adjust and change. So uh, in April, when the schools were open for a brief period, I went to pick up my son and I could see that all the primary grade students were coming in a line and keeping the two meter distance. But the parents at the gate were not keeping the distance, they were in a bunch. Because children learn very quickly, they can adapt and adjust very quickly. So opening schools and giving the social rhythm back to their life is very important. At home, uh, they are looking at screens, they are doing nothing, they are sedentary, they are gaining weight, uh, they are frustrated, they are bored, their social skills are waning. So it is important to open schools, but anything that need to be done from the pediatrician side for that to happen, we have to support that. Mm -hmm. uh, Again, when we have a large number of un an unvaccinated population also, there is a risk to uh, the children. So I understand when you say, doctor, that we have to look at, um, uh, look at a booster shot uh, to support uh, the already vaccinated adult and at-risk population. Um, but looking at the children itself, because our topic today to talk more about uh, children and their psychological, mental issues as well as their requirements. Um, how do you think the government and health professionals should approach this, especially in creating awareness? Because this fear is also derived with the lack of awareness and understanding among the, the parents as well as the population. Uh, how do you think we should address these issues? You meant uh, lack of awareness about the vaccination? Uh, about vaccination and about the requirement for their children. Now, this is a question and fear built among parents. So we are trying to understand and give them more information about uh, how, how we need to approach this problem. Yeah, uh, so the question uh, uh, is, uh, uh, what is the importance of vaccination of the children and the requirement and the understanding of the society about it. So uh, you look at it, uh, we can look at it differently. Uh, one thing is, uh, if we vaccinate the society, uh, many people in that, so in that society, whether children are protected or not. Another thing is, if we vaccinate children, uh, forgetting the society, uh, whether children get the protection. Uh, now, if we look at everything at this cross-section of the time, we have covered a, quite a number of uh, population at this point of time. We did not uh, believe at the initial stages whether we can vaccinate 50% of the population so sooner. Anyway, uh, we have done it. That's a fantastic job. And we must give the credit to all the people who have got involved. And then at this point, uh, we have covered most of the elderly population. We have covered most of the population between 18 and uh, 65 uh, who, who have comorbidities. And we have covered most of the population about uh, 30 years also. Between 20 and 30, there is a little bit of reluctancy getting vaccines. They are, they, you know, the young crowd uh, try to uh, choose vaccines. Uh, some people feel like better to get Pfizer vaccine. I think there is no rationality selecting vaccines. All vaccines are equal. At the end game, they prevent death and significant illnesses. So when the society and all the people, the majority of the people, at least 90 per 80, 90% get uh, vaccinated, the children get automatically protected. And if you look at their uh, home, this is another smaller environment. If the uh, elderly crowd uh, and the parents are vaccinated, the children, the vulnerability is less. And then the other uh, domain is when they go to school, uh, whether teachers are vaccinated or whether the ancillary staff is vaccinated. For my knowledge, 
we were able to initiate this uh, uh, program in uh, July and we were able to cover more than 90% of the teachers as well as the ancillary staff. So the, uh, because of this, children are being protected. And the second thing is that when we vaccinated the vulnerable group of children, especially children with comorbidities, uh, they get an equal chance of competing with the healthy children. So the healthy children have a, a, a good immunity or when they get the infection, true, they can transmit, but the, uh, the incidence are less, uh, but they won't get significant illnesses as well as death. So in this context, vaccination of the children uh, is important when they have specific illnesses. But other healthy children, once we covered all the other vulnerable groups, uh, we can move to those uh, two segment, two cohorts we are talking about, especially between 16 and 19, other group is 12 and 15. And same time, as I said earlier, we have to think about giving the booster shot to the uh, uh, elderly population to get uh, these uh, numbers up who have good immunity. So the uh, parents have to be patient and parents have to listen to the doctors. But I mean, we must encourage them to discuss these issues with us. And then uh, other point is uh, bringing children back to the school. The timeline is also important since children are at home, we can use this to uh, this time to sort out the other issues like psychosocial issues and vaccination the uh, uh, children with comorbidities and same time educating the parents. So there are a lot of myths uh, pa ch parents uh, think about and this uh, we have to bust these myths also uh, so that as uh, professionals when they come to get treatment we must use that opportunity to ask few questions how is your child do you have any concerns how is the behavior and do you have any issues regarding the vaccination and then we must take few minutes to address these things so in a uh, in summary uh, vaccinating children is important uh, we have to stick to a timeline and then I like to add another thing, dimension, that is opening of the school and vaccinating children should be two entities. We should not try to link it and like build a th theory like if we vaccinate children, we can open. If not, we have to delay it. We should not come to that side type of conclusion. But also, is it not important to talk about the vaccination of children, doctor, while we talk about opening uh, schools? Yes, uh, uh, yes, very, uh, very correct. Uh, we can uh, educate the public about uh, some of the issues they, they have. One thing is, uh, is this an experiment? This is not an experiment. We look at millions of uh, children being vaccinated in the West and the data is available. They use two vaccines specifically for this purpose, uh, that is Pfizer and Moderna. And if you look at uh, China, uh, they have vaccinated children about three years with Sinopharm. So the, those data is available. So the uh, number of uh, children vaccinated is quite a big but uh, it's not equally uh, spread across the world mm -hmm. uh, because the one of the argument is some of the countries are not vaccinated because as I said earlier, their priorities are different. And uh, then the other question is about the side effects. Mm -hmm. So side effects are minimum. What are the side effects we have to be concerned about? You can see a swelling of the area and pain as well as headaches, sometimes low grade fever. Uh, big talk is about this uh, uh, Pfizer vaccine sometimes can affect the heart. Yes, true. But the numbers are very minimum. If whatever the uh, intervention we use in uh, for a child, uh, even when we give medication for any other illness, when we do a surgery, it carries a risk. Uh, we look at the risk and benefit ratio. Uh, because if we vaccinate uh, 1 million of children, only uh, 12 to uh, 32 can get uh, this type of problem, uh, especially after the uh, second dose. And none have died and then uh, other thing is uh, they they are not going to get seriously ill. important thing is to have an awareness about it or do you think um, a vaccine mandate making it mandatory should be uh, required at any stage uh, for children, I don't think... For, uh, we for, ad for adults and going forward, because we also spoke about uh, reluctance uh, and, and some youth trying to pick and choose vaccines. So is, is, that, uh, is that jab, uh, a mandatory jab requirement? Uh, is that something we should brought in, or do you see some sort of enthusiasm among the general public and youth? That's a good question, the word mandatory. Mm -hmm. Now, when we give a treatment, can we make it mandatory? I, I don't think we should do that. And then, the, um, I, I have to be honest, the, the enthusiasm among the population in Sri Lanka is really good, comparing the West. Uh, people try to get vaccine by anyhow. 
and sometimes we must not interpret it negatively. Whenever, wherever the opportunities, we must give the vaccines. And uh, then uh, um, uh, uh, it is up to them to decide. As you said earlier, uh, educating the uh, society about this and their responsibility is the very important thing. And then we have to explain the benefits. And then other countries you have used the vaccine as a passport when you travel. The having uh, being uh, being vaccinated is a advantage uh, because people look for that. Even when you want to enter different restaurants, they ask for that uh, 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 vaccination card. We can do the same thing. And uh, my personal view is, uh, when we uh, open up the country, uh, especially in public areas, shopping malls, uh, where, where the people gather in a bigger number, uh, one of the requirements should be uh, having this. Uh, vaccination proof. So it, uh, we don't have to make it mandatory, but the circumstances make it uh, people to uh, uh, get the vaccination must. Right. I think on that note, it's time we take a short commercial break here at Hyde Park. We are in conversation about the psychology, the anxieties and the requirement of vaccines for children, whether or not. We'll be back after this short break. Uh, I'd like to turn to Dr. Um, Surat. I think um, we've been talking, uh, Dr. Muru, uh, we've been talking about um, the anxieties built up around uh, vaccination. But at the same time, I remember you mentioning to us that uh, there are also some positive skills that are being developed among children as a result of this new normal, as a result of children studying at home, being exposed to new skills, be it um, internet or working from home. Um, uh, learning at home but at the same time uh, experts say that screen time should be reduced to one hour and there are also some negative side effects as a result of children being uh, exposed at length to these um, technologies how do you think parents should handle this situation especially this is a psychological strain to them as well because they're on on one side uh, they've learned that children should be uh, their, their screen time should be limited and here there's a requirement, there's some, there's forced, um, uh, they, they, they're required to engage in this kind of learning, especially because schools are closed and you are confined to this environment at home. So compared to 2018 and 19, where the COVID was not there, uh, we have been part of a worldwide study with few universities in United Kingdom. Uh, we have seen that to our clinic, child and adolescent psychiatry clinics, more and more children are presenting compared to 2018 and 19 in 2020 and 2021. Mm -hmm. There's a 20% increase in anxiety, depression, screen addiction, video gaming addiction, mm -hmm. and emotional dysregulation. So when we say anxiety, first thing, children are scared when my father comes back from home, will he bring COVID? So he's anxious. Sometimes children are screaming to the father, please wash yourself before you come inside. Then children are anxious just without any reason. Mothers say they have sleep disturbance, they have nightmares, and they are sort of anxiety. Then there's depressive symptoms. Children who used to be very pleasant, cooperative, now get angry for minor things. They yell at their parents, parents yell back at them and they say they can't concentrate. They say, I have done two hours of online work, now I can't concentrate, I'm so bored, I'm so frustrated. A Lot of mental health issues. And the biggest thing, the screen time increase. Because worldwide studies have shown that the screen times have elevated remarkably. So there can be some positive effects like educational time, children learning to use these platforms, but screen times is known to be very strongly associated with long-term depressive anxiety and personality factor, personality deficits. Okay. So because when we are so dependent on screens, our real world relationships, our social relationships may get impaired as well as when we spend a lot of time on screens, this dependency can cause a lot of the, the only way of coping with boredom 
becomes a screen. Let's say children frequently say, I'm so bored, I need to watch something. Then the mother says, no, you can't watch. Then the child becomes upset and emotionally dysregulated. So only way of coping now has become the screen because child can't go out and play, can't meet their friends. So this can become a real big mental but health. But this will also have a longer term uh, impact on children as well. Um, uh, how, how do we manage that situation? Because yes, lockdown has been prolonged um, over time, but at the same time we are also looking at an exit to this pandemic situation and that also means that uh, reintegration and reinvolvement in uh, other aspects of life should continue for a healthy child. But how, how do you think parents should manage that also while not forgetting that this is a stressful period for uh, and a period for parents and there's a lot of demands for them too because they're working from home, they're trying to attend to um, work at home. So how do you think you should strike a balance in order to avoid these negativities? Okay, so when it comes to screen time in children, the World authorities, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. So AACAP have given recommendations about screen time for children. Mm -hmm. So this uh, two to five age gap, one hour screen time is for non-educational activities. Seeing your preschool teacher through the screen is not non-educational, it's educational. So if you see your class teacher or someone you know from the screens, that is not so negative compared to the time you spend on cartoons and other leisure activities. So online education is very important. Even though we have started using it frequently during the COVID pandemic, many other countries have been using it for tertiary education for decades. And some people have gotten degrees even without stepping a foot in that university because it's a very important thing that enables us to gain skills that are not available in the local setting. So on the other hand, but the parents need to be aware that they need to make a connection between the virtual world and the real world. So they learn through the online method, but parents have to check whether they have understood, whether there is comprehension, and whether the child has any psychological disturbance coming from the screens. So sometimes they frequently say, I have a headache. Uh, I have a headache in frontal part of my head and I have gone to a pediatrician. Pediatrician said, physically there's nothing wrong with me. Mm -hmm. I have a stomach ache, there's nothing wrong with me, family doctor said. Then sometimes they will say the child does not sleep and doesn't eat at usual. Sometimes these kind of physical symptoms may be an indication of psychological stress because when there is change in the secretion of stress hormones, there's muscle tension, mm -hmm. and that can cause undue pain in certain areas of the body. So if the parents are monitoring the stress, monitoring what they are looking from the screens, going through the internet browsing histories, and making the, env uh, the online environment safe, it is an essential part of children's learning. Uh, if I may turn to Dr. Suranta again, if I, I think you also might have something to add on the psychological, um, the challenges and the aspect of this, uh, not just the pandemic, but the question of vaccination. And also, if we talk a little about uh, reopening of schools, while there is a requirement uh, for children to go to school to re uh, to reemerge and engage in uh, activities at school. Uh, there is a pandemic situation, there is psychological, uh, there is there's fear built up around it. And at home, uh, there are limitations, but now children are used to um, online education. While we say no reduce screen time, now there is addiction. How do we balance this situation now going forward while schools are to reopen or not? And at home, balancing the situation at home, how do you think this should be addressed? Yes, uh, that, that is a, a good question because uh, uh, when we uh, look at this pandemic, it suddenly came and uh, 1.6 billion children in the world uh, uh, lost their education. They were homebound and then schools were closed. And if you look at Sri Lankan's uh, situation, in uh, 2020, we closed schools once or twice and then uh, 2021, we closed schools in March and thereafter, uh, it was not open up to now. Uh, so if we look at the two years, uh, quite a uh, number of months, school days were lost 
and children did, children did not have the opportunity to attend schools. So, uh, and not only that, children did not have prior training uh, how to handle tools to get online education. Neither teachers, they were not trained how to give education. Because uh, what I am talking about is when we talk about children, it, there is a specific group called preschool. And then children belong to 5 years to uh, 16 years. And then about 16 A-level uh, students. So uh, their skill of handling these tools, how they engage them, uh, is different at uh, different ages. So uh, suddenly it happened, so it's uh, challenging for them. And uh, not only that, uh, when we compare schools and uh, uh, home, the main important thing is children uh, learn as groups and then human interaction and then they interact with the uh, teacher and they, that is the opportunity for them to express their views and then uh, di develop dialogues and they learn how to handle communication with adults in a more responsible manner. In team discussions they learn to communicate with the groups. Those are necessary skills. We can't uh, artificially, de through simulation, we can't do that. And then uh, when you look at a face, you learn uh, different uh, expressions. And uh, how do you understand it? Because uh, uh, when we communicate, we use words as well as we use expressions uh, and uh, certain signs. So that is very important. Uh, because uh, in future, they can have issues when they uh, work in the society. So we have to be mindful about these things. As Mira said, uh, they, they had uh, many issues. Uh, especially when they uh, communicate with the uh, uh, teachers and the colleagues through these tools, uh, computers and uh, tabs, etc. Uh, the, the screen time has improved. Yes, true, we engage in uh, use computers, but not that excessively. The screen time is so much, so the, it has physical strain, it has a mental strain. And uh, but we doctor, have to be mindful of the If I may interrupt, things. there is also a, a structural imbalance here uh, when, when they're learning at home, learning from home. Uh, there is no structure as you would expect in school where you start school at 7.30 and finish at 1.30, let's say. But here online education is provided uh, whether it's early morning or later on in the evening. So there is, there is continuous strain on the minds of children as well. And, uh, and on the other side, isn't this time now to reopen schools, the traditional uh, learning methods, uh, especially because um, teachers must have now uh, been fully vaccinated uh, as, as per data uh, and, and as per the vaccination drive aggressively carried out by authorities? Yeah, uh, I like to focus on two words you have used, structure and routine. We learn, because when we work in the schools, there's a particular time we, uh, there are certain periods, there's a particular time we start the school, we close the school, we have an interval time. So you develop a structure and a routine uh, in the children. So that is very important. Uh, it's important in the adult life also. What has, uh, so the disruption of this structure and routine has disrupted their lifestyle also. And then uh, if we look at some of the research papers coming out, it has uh, disrupted uh, their sleep time and then uh, their behavior. They are seeing uh, night terrors and uh, they are going into, s although they go to bed, they go do not go into real sleep. And uh, then their uh, interaction with the uh, pa parents also. So a uh, lot has affected. Uh, and then uh, another dimension, uh, what I want to add is uh, uh, school provide opportunity for good nutrition uh, as well as uh, it's uh, uh, if the uh, if they are in a vulnerable area, if the uh, if there is a higher chance of getting bullied or abuse in the uh, home, uh, especially when they are uh, when they remain at home in this particular time, uh, we say in the morning, uh, because uh, the parents have to go to work, uh, the, uh, the school provides safe environment. So uh, when the schools are closed, uh, these changes are these settings are changed. So uh, not only that, uh, their structure and routine has changed. Uh, some of the children have become more vulnerable to uh, child abuse and um, uh, some of the uh, other health issues. And they lack exercise. They develop. They have developed obesity and abnormal eating habits also. Mm -hmm. So what is important is to have a timeline to open schools. So UNESCO has addressed it. 
they have addressed three key areas that is bringing t children back to school and how do, how we how we are going to recover the lost time and then how we are going to continue the education not only that whether uh, uh, the teachers are uh, fully trained uh, in this counseling process because uh, they must allow children to ventilate uh, their grievances as well their well as their experiences so this will provide a great opportunity when the school starts uh, to counsel these uh, children and then uh, to address some of the psychological issues as well as do the uh, referral system mm -hmm. so the vaccination of uh, children also uh, can take place so the sooner the uh, sooner we start the school it's better um, Dr. Miru, I think uh, we are trying to also understand what the signs of uh, the stresses of children being confined to homes and these situations are. How do they expose it? How do they put it out? And uh, what recommendations do you have to parents, elders, teachers in dealing with these anxieties? Uh, and I'd also like to add to that question about uh, a structure, um, including or incorporating a structure, whether it be at home or uh, in, in, in learning, while they are not able to access traditional educational methods. How do you uh, uh, recommend that we address these issues? So very good question. The first part, the signs of psychological disturbance is the most frequent thing is irritability. That is getting angry more than usual. So parents say, my child was to be very cooperative. He used to follow instructions when I gave, but now he's a bit stubborn, doesn't follow the instructions and a bit oppositional. Uh, that's the opposite of what we asked him or her to do. Yeah. So increased irritability is the first sign. Then change of sleep pattern. So sometimes online education can go into night, which will disturb the natural sleep rhythm and can cause uh, negative emotional dysregulation. So because of that, sometimes children may sleep more during the day, less during the night. So that is the second thing. Third thing, change in their appetite and eating pattern. They may be eating more than usual and gaining weight or some children who are severely having depressive symptoms may eat less and lose weight. And also difficulty in concentrating. They frequently say they can't look at the book, they feel bored and they can't concentrate. So they either walk mm -hmm. or they look at the phone or the notifications. Mm -hmm. So these are the signs of psychological distress. Then what the parents have to do, first thing as you said, bring structure back to home. At school, there were certain periods, there was a bell, but at home, there's not, no such thing. So at home, you have to uh, draw a small pictures and put it on where the children can see, where when you get up, you have to complete these three tasks. When you have the lunch, you have to complete these three tasks. Everybody in the house can see them. Then if you complete them, there's a social reward. What is the social reward? Maybe you can watch TV for one hour, your favorite program. Or if you complete this, father will take you and have some playtime in the front yard. Or you can have your favorite meal, maybe cook something special. If you have completed these tasks in the schedule, the parents have made. So when you are making the schedule, obviously there's online education, there should be playtime, time for music, time for drawing, depending on the child's cognitive stage and the psychological development. Then, obviously, this is a great opportunity for parents to teach skills that are very important. So if, when you go to school, there's a period for mathematics, science, Sinhalese, but there's no period for time management, empathy, emotional understanding. So those are very important skills the parents can impart on children during this time. So those are the things parents can Shouldn't do. the onus of bringing a structure, especially when it comes to uh, online education, be also on health authorities or those providing online education, teachers, be it from your school? Because now we understand that parents at home, they're trying to balance their work from home requirements and um, requirements and their, their commitments and demands uh, at home. And uh, 
providing a structure through education time uh, to, to a timetable or whether it be morning to afternoon without uh, dragging it until evening shouldn't shouldn't that also be shared by educational authorities absolutely correct so as the Sri Lanka College of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists I'm very happy to say we have even made a request to there about the times of online education and there has been a lot of positive response from the well recognized media but obviously some uh, tuition classes have been going on in the early morning or very late night obviously parents please be uh, careful when your child's sleep duration and the sleep structure changes it can cause increase in irritability and depressive symptoms and it can invariably can cause long-term psychological problems mm -hmm. and these uh, yes this can affect in the long run as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have very little time but I'd like to uh, turn to Dr. Suranta Pereira. Where do we go from here? What strategies do you recommend? We spoke about whether or not to open schools. We spoke about whether or not to vaccinate children um, between uh, the ages of 12 and 15 and 15 to 19 the strategies you propose going forward. Um, we are talking about a new normal, but we're also talking about beyond this, um, managing um, symptoms of COVID, the fears of COVID, and other requirements for children and adults. What are the strategies you propose? Yeah, uh, if we talk about the vaccination of the children, we have to balance it, vaccinating the uh, some of the needy populations. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we commence vaccinating children with comorbidities on uh, 24th of September. Now it has been rolled out to uh, other uh, districts. Uh, it will be rolled out to other districts on 1st of October. Uh, on uh, that day, we celebrate the World Children's Day in Sri Lanka. So that is a good day to address these issues. And the second thing is we can vaccinate the uh, elderly population who need the third dose. We need the concurrence of the Ministry of Health regarding this. Once we do both the, both of these things, uh, we can move to vaccinating other children between 16 and 19 years, as well as children between 12 and 15 years. Okay. So that is the timeline. It can we can achieve these targets within the coming months because we are expecting a lot of Pfizer vaccine as well as the other vaccine stocks. So that way we can population uh, we can when we look at the uh, Sri Lankan population we can. Uh, make sure the vulnerable groups are protected against the COVID-19. Then when we come to uh, end of November, beginning of December, like we can uh, get uh, think about opening the schools. But uh, currently, I think education ministry is focused on opening the schools, uh, especially the uh, up to uh, grade five uh, in smaller uh, schools because uh, I think uh, this population is at a disadvantage when it comes to online education because of poverty, lack of equipment and lack of access to online education. So the opening schools, we can do it stepwise. Already it has been proposed uh, and it will be activated in month of uh, uh, October. But I think uh, when we look at the bigger picture, opening the uh, almost other schools should be done in a structured manner. and. Uh, we can initiate some of the other discussions parallel to these things. Uh, what about the future of children in post-COVID era? After this, what, where we should go? And then, uh, we, because the, uh, we, our approach should be scientific and robust, and then we have to include many stakeholders, groups in this discussion. One example is if children are get used to more of, of these gadgets, uh, will they be more autistic? And then how, how would be their relationship with the peers as well as the colleagues in future? And as well as we have to be concerned about parental anxieties and their questions. We can use the mass media to educate them. Whenever possible, we should do it. I mean, we don't have to appear all the time in these TVs. We, we can do it in a smaller way when we meet them in different discussion arenas. Like uh, when we do the consultation, it can be in the ward, it can be on the road when we meet uh, our friends. Uh, we, I, I, as a person, usually all opportunities to educate them because it's our uh, role uh, as a responsible professional people in the society to make sure society is safer. 
Uh, I think uh, you brought us to a very good um, uh, wrap up uh, a topic where we can discuss um, the future for children in post COVID era. That's something that I would like to ask both our professionals, medical professionals, um, as, as a um, note to uh, wrap up tonight's uh, discussion. What should we prepare for? Yes, uh, so the, my, uh, I like to uh, like show the impact uh, this way. Uh, we make decision as adults in the boardrooms, uh, but children are uh, watching us. Uh, whether are we opening the school? Are we giving the vaccines? Uh, are, have we involved them in decision making? Uh, what about the youth and the adolescents? And we have to open a discussion. We must not uh, be uh, uh, very like. Uh, we must not practice uh, uh, like divisional politics, and we must bring people uh, together. And uh, we must. Uh, be concerned about their opinion also. And uh, the second thing is, uh, as uh, intellectual people, uh, we have different interests. I think my interest is the uh, uh, children's uh, problem. And uh, there are other groups uh, who are interested in public health. Some are interested in vaccination. Some are interested in education. We should come together. Mm -hmm. So uh, we call it intersectoral coordination. That is very important. And then uh, uh, government has a huge role to play. And we should initiate discussion. What is our next five-year plan, and how we uh, do, uh, how we make decisions? And not only that, we must not forget. We must carry out research and audits. Mm. Our decision should be supported by evidence we gathered from local data, evidence we gathered from international data, mm -hmm. and that is very important. So our uh, we can lay down our policies, and uh, and as well as. We must ensure all vulnerable groups are being looked after. Mm -hmm. Children is a children are vulnerable group. So is the pregnant mothers. So is the elderly, GDIT population. So they are really vulnerable. And then uh, post COVID era, we have to pay more attention to the uh, the scars left in their mind. Right. Because uh, what about the death, uh, loss of father, mm -hmm. mother, as well as a very close one uh, during this pandemic? We have to be really concerned about these issues. And then uh, we must develop programs, especially counseling programs. We must provide opportunities for them to uh, get access to healthcare services. Uh, most important thing is not to forget the future generation. Uh, one day we have to hand over this country, the leadership and the strategic position to these people, and we have to safeguard. We have a very healthy uh, younger population who will be the future leaders in this country. I think uh, Dr. Muru also will have uh, something to add on these lines, the, the, the post-COVID era, the future of our children before we wrap up for today. So the message to parents and teachers is don't bring your expectations and force your child to study from the day one when the schools open. Take it slow, allow them to express their emotions, get together with their friends, build the social relationships. Emotional understanding and social relationships are far more important than covering the curriculum and the syllabus. So please take note of the mental health of your child that will impact decades to come of this country. Thank you very much. I think uh, it's time we wrap up, wrap up tonight's edition of At Hyde Park. Uh, we had with us Dr. Suranta Pereira, consultant pediatrician and neonatologist, uh, past president of the Perinatal Society of Sri Lanka, a member of the College of uh, Pediatricians and a member of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Thank you very much for your time here. Yeah, uh, also, we had uh, with us joining today at Hyde Park Dr. Muru Chandradasa, consultant, uh, child and adolescent psychiatrist, and also you're an editor at the Sri Lanka College of Child and Adoles Adolescent Psychiatrist Journal. So thank you for uh, sharing your insights with us tonight. Thank you very much. I think we were able to speak at length about the psychological uh, impact as well as the anxieties built around vaccination of children, the, the requirement for children, how we need to prepare ourselves in bringing a structure and routine for children, and at length about the situation surrounding the pandemic. Thank you very much for joining us here at Hyde Park tonight. Have a pleasant evening. Good night. <laughs>